Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Sandwich Public Library. Although it is virtual, we are glad that you are here. My name is Matthew Jones and I serve as the Adult Services Coordinator here at the library. Thank you for sharing your lunch hour with us today for our Mayoral Candidate Community Forum. We are truly honored to be hosting this event and we're thankful to our mayoral candidates for joining us virtually. And so I wanna welcome uh, Mayor Rich Robinson, uh, Mr. Todd Latham and Mr. Jim McMaster. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, in this hour, we will be asking uh, your questions. Many of you have submitted questions questions uh, in advance online. And so we'll be asking some of those. Some of you already have begun to ask questions in the, Q &A, in the Q and a box. Um, and so feel free to continue doing that as we proceed throughout the hour. We'll get through as many questions and through as many different topics as we can in the hour. And uh, we will conclude today by hearing some final remarks from each candidate. And um, we'll, we'll try our best to finish up right at the hour. Um, but we're going to begin our time with a question that I've shared with the candidates in advance. And the question is, what motivated you to run for mayor of Sandwich? We'll begin by hearing from Rich Robinson. Good afternoon, uh, Rich Robinson, uh, current mayor of Sandwich. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, as far as what motivated me to be mayor of Sandwich or want to be mayor of Sandwich, I guess I need to go back about 12 years uh, when I first ran for mayor um, and lost. Uh, from that point on, I didn't think I would ever be mayor or want to be mayor in the city of Sandwich again. Matter of fact, six, well, probably five to six years ago, uh, uh, former Mayor Olson actually had inquired during his first term if I was interested in running again. And of course I told him absolutely not that uh, when I retire, I've got better things to do. And uh, I don't think I'd want that headache. Um, obviously, some things have changed. Uh, in May of 2019, I was appointed mayor by the uh, full elected city council here in Sandwich. Um, I, I took the position with, uh, with great pride and knowing that I could step up and basically uh, lead the council for at least the next two years. Uh, it wasn't until after uh, the first year, during that first year, where almost immediately we were hit with uh, some of the worst flooding here in Sandwich. Um, and then just our regular everyday uh, city things going on. And then of course, getting into the coronavirus pandemic, uh, leading the city through these trying times, I felt like I was doing a good job doing it. And I then decided that it was something that I wanted to do. Uh, made the announcement last July. Um, like I said, the last almost two years now have been the mayor. Uh, some people say acting mayor. I don't feel like I've earned it yet only because I've been appointed, not elected. Um, time will tell whether or not I do get elected or not, but it is something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, we've got a lot of challenges here in the city of Sandwich, a lot of things coming up. And I think that I'm prepared to uh, lead with the council and get us through these challenges for the next several years. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Latham, uh, what motivated you to run for mayor of Sandwich? Sure. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that you think about when you run for mayor is do you have the time commitment? And the answer is absolutely. I would not have uh, put forward my petition and made forth the effort if I wasn't fully committed to uh, running for mayor. Uh, it does take a considerable amount of time, but you know, one thing to think about is the role of the mayor is not to uh, row the boat, it's to steer it. And um, so, you know, I grew up in the community in the 1970s. This was a very uh, nice, safe place to live. I enjoyed uh, playing outside, uh, going throughout the community. We had great stores downtown like uh, Lloyd's and Sue Ann Shop, uh, Anderson Bushnell's or Anchor Stores. Um, and then I went in the military and came back and decided to make this uh, the community that I was going to raise my family in. I did so. I, I've been involved in the community uh, since I returned in uh, 1996. Uh, and then, um, you know, I came back to the council. I was 27 years old when I was elected in 1997. Um, it was kind of a time of growth. Uh, you think about things that would have went in. Uh, it would have been the movie theater, uh, KFC. It would have been the Yum Yum, Yum Shop, not Johnny K's. Uh, we had a lot of residential 
exponential growth, and that led to us bringing Walgreens in. Walgreens was instrumental because it took tax dollars and opportunity away from Walmart, which um, was right next to us, and it basically boosted our tax base. And then um, from there, I, I ran uh, for a couple of different positions. I've been in the Park District for eight years. I've served three as its president. Uh, took us through a planning time frame, which is kind of my expertise, and uh, some growth. We've got uh, healthy reserves. We've done a lot of great things for the community. And I believe it's time to return back to the city council. I kind of see the community in somewhat of a, of a decay. We lost a major car dealership. And those are all things that we simply can't do. We can't let our, our plan of our neighbor and yet good friend take the business away from us. They said it was time to run for mayor and improve our infrastructure. Um, it's one of the things I hear, our streets, sidewalks, sewers, floodings, they're all problems and they have to be addressed. And I'm ready to take on that role. Excellent, thank you so much. And uh, last but not least, Mr. McMaster, what motivated you to run for mayor of Sandwich? Well, it started three or four years ago. I noticed that a lot of things weren't getting fixed in town. And uh, I just started checking on a few things and found out that the lift station I put in in 2008 still wasn't up and running. I found out that it was because somebody forgot to get an easement for the electricity to run it. Now, that takes care of the sewer for the Fairwind subdivision, which currently is running down through the old sewer system. And without that, it causes a lot of problems on Main Street and Castle Street with sewer backing up. And for some reason, I know it was partially due because they forgot to get an easement for the electricity. But anyway, I found out that it wasn't being used. And there's a lot of other things that were being neglected. And I decided I was going to run for mayor and see if I could figure out why these things aren't being taken care of. Uh, that pretty much sums it up. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you all for responding to that question. And now we'll get into the questions uh, from the community. And so we've asked all the candidates to be as concise as possible so that we can get through as many questions as we can. Our first uh, round of questions here will have to do with the role of mayor, which has already been mentioned. As a uh, mayor of Sandwich, how would you describe the purpose of Sandwich? How does Sandwich serve its citizens? And we'll begin this time with Mr. Latham. Sure. So as I mentioned, the role of mayor, um, you're really the representative of all the citizens of Sandwich. Uh, you have to work directly with the city council. Uh, everyone has to be um, not always in agreement, but you have to be on, on the same uh, thought process of where we want to take the community. Uh, and I, I think that's really the role of that. Um, you know, many of the things that you, you want to accomplish are through conversation and it's reaching out to the community, uh, letting them be involved uh, in uh, directing us in what direction they want us to uh, take uh, matters. And it's basically carrying that out and being responsible to them. Uh, you know, sometimes I think as elected officials, we uh, sometimes uh, just only have certain groups that we interact with them or that we uh, get information from. And I think it's important that we look at everyone in the community. One of the things I'm proposing is a, a citizens advisory committee. That's important because I need to hear uh, information from other individuals that I may not be aware of and, and issues that might be addressed. And certainly the role of mayor then would be to take that back to the city council and to find a solution for those issues that uh, our community feels needs uh, taken care of. And also that is long range planning, uh, making sure that we uh, bring in good sound businesses, economic development, and that we prosper as a community and uh, move forward in the right direction. If you take a look at the census uh, from 2010 to 2020, Sandwich has actually declined in population, makes it difficult to attract businesses. And uh, you know, working as a council in the community, we're gonna move forward full speed ahead. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Mr. McMaster, same question to you. Uh, how does how does Sandwich serve its citizens? Well, serves in many ways. Uh, I don't know. Right. I can't think it out right now. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, and Mayor Robinson, how how would you describe the purpose of Sandwich? How does it serve its citizens? Oh, you're still on mute. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, technology, right? Exactly. Um, the, the, the role of mayor and as far as how the city serves its citizens is something that occurs every single day, whether you're talking about turning on your faucet to get a drink of water or being able to flush your toilet, uh, driving down the road. Um, all of these things go together. Um, 
you know, infrastructure is a big thing that we've been talking about. And these are all services that we provide in the city of Sandwich, the water, the sewer, the, the streets we drive on, the sidewalks that we walk or our kids ride the bikes on. So those are just many of the services that we provide. But Todd hit it on the head where he said that the mayor's position is basically to lead and direct and guide the council as far as where we're going. The council is who makes all the decisions. They make all the decisions as far as the big dollar decisions and what occurs. The mayor might be making the everyday daily operation decisions as far as what's going on in the city, just so it's functioning smoothly and that it is basically being streamlined and nothing is getting caught up and not being done uh, sim simplicity wise because they have to wait until Monday when the council discusses something or um, votes on something. But again, it's a matter of working together, not only with the council members and trying to decide how we can provide the best services and using the, the best, I guess, uh, uh, money possible. Um, we don't have a lot of money. So it's a matter of figuring out, you know, what the priorities are and uh, going that route to get the things done in the city of Sandwich. And that's what we have to do to serve them. Excellent, thank you. Um, you've covered some of the other questions that were mentioned here, so I'm going to move along um, with another question about the role of the mayor and how you would um, lead, as you mentioned. And uh, Mr. Latham, you mentioned the idea of an uh, advisory council, citizen advisory council. There was a couple questions that came in about opening up feedback loops with the community in that way or others, um, including a question about whether you would be willing to record city meetings and post them on YouTube, for example, in order for people to have greater access um, to these meetings and other uh, such events. Um, so how would you, uh, if you're elected mayor, how would you open up more feedback loops in the community to hear from the citizens? And this time uh, we'll begin with Mr. McMaster. I didn't quite understand the question. Yeah, how would you open up feedback loops so that you can hear from the community about the, the, the citizens, hear from the citizens about the community? Oh, I'd, I'd open it up, let them hear everything. I mean, it's their city. Very good. And then this, we'll go on then to Mr. Robinson. Uh, currently, all of our meetings are recorded. All of our meetings are open to the public. Um, when the Fox Valley Cable Consortium was still in existence as far as with uh, uh, weekly uh, tapings of our meetings, it had been done. Um, that had sort of disbanded. It still exists, but it's not actually live functioning like it was previously where it was recording the meetings. And I think that's where some of the citizens probably miss out on being able to see that after the fact. Um, it has been discussed very briefly as far as doing it, but what it all comes down to is a time and a money factor as far as, you know, somebody being able to sit there and record it. And, you know, we probably could have a YouTube channel or put it on the internet, put it on our Facebook, um, you know, put it on our website. Uh, I believe most of the minutes are turned into the uh, website uh, might not be as timely as what people think, but it's also one of those things where the meeting is open to the public. I understand that, you know, during the COVID, it was very comfortable for people when we couldn't have in-person meetings and we were doing remote meetings that people could participate more than and see it live what was occurring rather than relying on what they're going to read in the newspaper that week or possibly what was covered by a radio station. Excellent. All right, and uh, uh, next on then to Mr. Latham. How would you open up feedback loops? Right, so the, uh, the Fox Valley Consortium uh, was a great idea that came about when I was on the council. It was ran through Obanzi Community College with their program, so we had a dual partnership. And uh, Rich is correct. Um, it's probably something that uh, probably isn't utilized somewhere. One of the limitations was is, is that uh, you could only get it if you had Comcast. So there was a certain population that didn't get Comcast. So YouTube would be a great alternative. Many uh, municipalities uh, use that as an access. Everyone can get that through the internet. Um, according to the Open Meetings Act and by law, you have to record your meetings verbally and uh, in written format, and it would just be further compliance 
Um, I believe it's it's a great idea. I, I think it opens transparency. Let's people tune in. Um, they can view. They wouldn't be able to actively participate because uh, it's not that kind of interactive forum. Uh, but it is great to get the word out and people that maybe work different shifts or are unavailable in the community could certainly come back to YouTube and, and watch a council meeting at another time. It's a great venue that we should pursue. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, here comes another question and this time we'll begin again with Mayor Robinson. The number of employees at City Hall has been identified as being low. What are the mayoral candidates' views on cross-training personnel from other departments to assist and vice versa? Um, it's a good question. It's something that has been talked about for several years. Uh, it is probably a lower priority of things being done. Uh, it was one of the things that was mentioned this past um, spring, um, I apologize, fall, uh, when we had done a uh, strategic planning session with NIU Center for Government Studies, uh, we had talked about that with the council and with upper management as far as how we could do that. The problem is using personnel and cross-training, uh, specifically they're talking about personnel from the police department, um, administrative assistance from the police department, being able to help out with certain things. Several years ago, when we were low on uh, personnel here at City Hall, there is a member there at the police department uh, that is cross-trained and had been trained to be able to help out to do payroll and some other things um, if needed. As far as it being something that would be scheduled, uh, again, it's only been in the discussion phase. It hasn't come to fruition with things to be done. Uh, we're pretty much short everywhere, I would say, within the city, with the exception of the police department. That be my personal opinion, but as far as manpower and staffing goes, I would say um, we are short. But again, we try to do the best we can with the money we have. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Latham, same question to you. Um, would you support cross-training personnel from other departments to assist in City Hall? Well, I certainly think it's an excellent idea. It's a certain uh, function of human resources that you utilize uh, personnel that you already had. Uh, to do other functions that uh, you may be shorthanded or, or emergency that you might need other personnel. Um, what we've done at the park district, matter of fact, our financial software is the same as the school districts. Uh, we can also exchange personnel between governmental bodies. Um, it does a great thing. It allows you to let your staff take vacation time, personal time, uh, emergency, emergency time that they have. A lot of times people leave the job thinking that if they're the only person that does a function like payroll, uh, that they can't get too far and it does limit them to uh, have some downtime. We all need that to recharge and be better employees. So it is a great plan. I think I look at uh, where those opportunities are and then start the process um, of where it's available. Excellent. All right, and uh, on to Mr. McMaster, would you support cross-training personnel from various departments in the city to serve at City Hall? Yeah, I think it sounds like a good idea. I mean, uh, I think it'd be a great help if somebody from the police department could help out in City Hall. I don't think there's anybody in City Hall that could help out in the police department, but uh, it's a good idea, yeah. Excellent. All right, um, let's move on then to a different topic here, and the conversation will be all around city growth. Um, and the first question here I'm going to read to you. A sandwich has the potential for being a unique community. Last summer, Netflix recognized Sandwich as having one of the 20 funniest town names in America, yet we've done nothing to capitalize on that recognition. There are all sorts of ways the community could build on that recognition. In order to address all the infrastructure improvements and other city project, our town needs money, but people and businesses don't seem to want to come here. Aside from a couple tenacious businesses, our downtown is primarily made up of empty storefronts, bars, and gaming establishment, hardly family friendly. Residents and businesses are a source of tax revenue. How do you plan to create a community where families will want to live and attract businesses that reflect a more positive and desirable sandwich? And we'll begin this time with Mr. Latham. Well, I think sandwich is, uh, it's not funny if you live here. It's funny when you go someplace else. Uh, I experienced that in my military career. Everyone thought sandwich was a hilarious name. Um, 
So I, I didn't realize Netflix had uh, singles out. That's actually a great accolade. I think we should take advantage of it. I'm going to work on making t-shirts as soon as I log off today and uh, see if we can capitalize on that. Um, no, I, I do think um, one of the ways that you can do that is, is um, I do understand family friendly is important. Um, at the park district, I had proposed and we developed a plan that uh, would incorporate citywide walking, biking, jogging paths that uh, connected all of our parks um, with inner city routes, um, crossing north and south across the tracks and led us to uh, connect the Sandok Forest Preserve, which now you can go to Samanak and Lake Holiday. So I think it's a, it's a great way to look at the recreation to get people out. Uh, to attract businesses is a difficult thing. I think some of our fees are set at a pre-2007 level when we had the uh, sandwich economic boom where we were developing. And uh, I think those are currently prohibiting development and we would need to get rooftops first. Uh, we have uh, a lot of empty lots. You look at uh, Fairwind subdivision and uh, most of that just stopped with the, the collapse of 2007. It was about a good five years or more before we started seeing some type of homes being built here and they're minimal. And once you get that going, then you can attract uh, other types of businesses. These people are, are in that business. They know demographics. They know what to look for. Um, they look at census data. It's out for 2020. Um, you can see uh, that 11% of our population is disabled. We have more women than men that live in the community. Um, you can see the households. Uh, you can see what our income is. They want to make sure that we have disposable income. Uh, when we attracted Walgreens, those are things they looked at. We reached out to Target. We were too small. They went to Yorkville. So I think when you look at quality of life, it's a couple of things. It's recreational. It's a, a town that people enjoy, uh, people want to visit. And then I think part of that is providing goods and services as well as employment and opportunity. Uh, business are, are important. The downtown is looking empty. And we've got to find creative ways with our Chamber of Commerce to stimulate that growth. And I want people to live and stay here. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. McMaster, same question to you. How do you plan to create a community where families will want to live and where businesses will want to uh, plant themselves to reflect a more positive and desirable sandwich? Well, first of all, we got to get some business in town. So I, I don't know what it would take to get more people in town. I'm sure there's some way. I don't know if our uh, Chamber of Commerce needs to be looked at and see if they can figure something out. Or maybe we need new people in there. I don't know. But I'd definitely look into it. Excellent. Mr. Robinson, same question to you. How would you attract families to live here and businesses to come? Well, it's, it's difficult for the cities because when you want the big box stores or you want industry to come to town, they want the rooftops, like Todd had mentioned. And it's tough to get the rooftops in when we don't have various businesses that are gonna attract people to live here. I do think we have a ton of attractions to bring people to Sandwich to wanna to make this home. You've got you know great park district, the library, the hospital here in town, um, lots of things that are going to attract the families. Now, you know even the schools, I think we've got a good school district and things like that. As far as how the city can encourage more, um, it's going to probably be a little bit of thinking out of the box. A few years ago, we did a build program here in town where we actually, for I believe we extended it twice, maybe only once, but for a year or two, we did it where we basically cut the impact fees in half. Um, I believe it was the impact fees, but basically the building permits, all that money we cut in half for builders trying to encourage people to put up more houses here in town. One thing we have going for us right now with the economy is that when a house goes up for sale here in Sandwich, a lot of times it's sold before it's even officially listed. Um, and that's just the way the market is right now. So I think that speaks well of us too. Uh, people are correct. There are some empty storefronts downtown. Uh, I, I think part of that is COVID related. You know, there were people that were starting new businesses a year ago when COVID first started and, you know, they had invested and, you know, they still had to pay rent. They still had to pay their leases and things like that for the property. But I think things like that changed how things are going to work with people working at home and stuff like that. We've got a nice community and it's just a matter of encouraging more people to do that. I talked earlier about that strategic planning session we had. One of the things that we had thrown out was, you know, do we forego a bunch of the uh, building requirements and stuff like that, especially for some of these holding, older buildings? that because of the current code, people wouldn't be able to move a business into there 
because of all of the restrictions that we have in the current code. These are just things being tossed around. Nothing's been decided yet, but these are all possibilities. And again, I think it's just something that we as the council and with city input need to continue working on to continue to make city a great city, Sandwich a great city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sort of a follow-up question to what was mentioned previously. Um, uh, our, our town has allowed more gaming establishments with an already sluggish economy that has been further exacerbated by the pandemic. Businesses are closing or leaving um, yet, um, yet we're hosting places for people to risk money they really can't afford to lose. Who does this serve? More importantly, what does the widespread presence of gaming communicate about the type of community we are? As mayor, what would you do to change this? And this time we'll begin with Mr. McMaster. And so the question is, um, what would you do um, about the gaming establishments and what are, you, what are your thoughts on having those present in our community at the level they are? Well, I think we've got plenty of gaming establishments. Uh, probably try to even get rid of a few of them because I don't think they're doing the community any good at, at all. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, Mr. Robinson, uh, same question to you. Uh, what would you do uh, about the gaming presence in our community? What are your thoughts on that? And would you want to change it? If so, how? Well, I would first like to clarify because at the beginning you said that uh, we've been adding more and that is not the case. Uh, the city of Sandwich has actually turned down several businesses that want to have standalone gaming uh, facilities, uh, specifically some gas stations in town that would like to have it. Uh, we would have to create a new liquor ordinance uh, for them to be able to do that. And speaking with the city council, there has been no interest in doing that. And I would say this goes back probably about three or four years. The city currently only has two K licenses which are basically for a standalone gaming facility and that's it. And those are the only two that we have in town. And I, I would say without a doubt for the last four years, there's been no interest of adding any more. Now I will point out that by law, anybody that has a current liquor license where alcohol can be consumed on premise, they are allowed to apply for a gaming license through the state of Illinois. We've got no control over that because gaming's allowed. And so that's what occurs. We get money from the state for that. Um, I don't recall this past year what the amount of money is that the city of Sandwich gets. Um, I, I think it's somewhere between fifty dollars and $100,000 a year that we bring in in gaming. All that information's available online and you can see, and you'd be amazed at the amount of money that some of these places take in. I understand the concern um, as far as thinking that some places have too many. Um, very few uh, places that have on-premise consumption don't have. Um, sorry, I lost your picture there. You're back now. Uh, there's only a couple of places in town that have on-premise consumption that do not um, have gaming machines. Excellent. That's very helpful information. Thank you. And lastly, to you, Mr. Latham. Sure. So uh, it is correct. So in order to have a uh, game in your establishment, you do have to have a liquor license as set by state law. And the information is out there. And I do agree it is uh, significant when you look at what some of these establishments bring in as uh, their initial money before they do their payout. Um, but I, I see uh, people's point of view, right? So gaming is an individual choice. People uh, determine what they can afford and what they can risk. And I do understand that uh, it, it can be addictive for some people. Um, I, but I don't want us to be the route. Uh, you know, when you look at Samus, we have a significant amount of banks, gas stations, liquor stores, and antique stores. And uh, we don't want to add gaming to that is all we're known for. Um, not to say that those businesses are bad or that I'm against those. It's just simply that there's a large amount of those in our community. And I think it's our responsibility as uh, city leaders and uh, leaders in the community to go ahead and look at uh, different opportunities that we can bring into the community that provide those other types of goods and services that people want. Uh, gaming is something that uh, is regulated by the state. Um, 
And uh, what we can do is just look for other ways to um, entice people to come to our community and spend their hard earned money here. And then we can use that for other projects that we need for improvements. Excellent, thank you. We're now gonna speak about the police station. That has been a question that's come up even in some of the questions that have been submitted here online in this hour. One of the biggest conversations that this election has surrounded is the police station. But what is the mayor's role in projects like this? Uh, the issue of flooding has also come up several times. How does the mayor affect change that makes a difference? What role does the mayor have in making decisions in the community? And we'll begin this time with um, Mr. Latham. All right, so the question is, is uh, what's the mayor role in, in affecting change in the community? So uh, the mayor is the leader, right? They're the ones that set the tone, set the direction for uh, the city to follow. Uh, you know, part of that setting the agenda, find out what's important to the community. Um, I understand that the police department is a, a major conversation topic. Um, I do believe that uh, there's, you know, people on both sides of the issue, and I certainly understand that. Some say, uh, build it as needed, don't build it. And then maybe there's a third group that says, why there? Um, I do think we need to listen to those concerns. Um, unfortunately, I think probably the project's too far. It's already been approved for bonding. The building's been bought. Um, you know, I think the reservations that we'd have now is can we build it for the amount of money that we have? And uh, that would just, uh, you know, be fiscal mis uh, fiscal management and oversight of the project. Um, when we talk about change, um, you know, we talk about where we want to go, and that comes back to one of your first questions: is how do people become involved, and, and you know, how do we listen, and what do we do? Um, and that's opening up those lines of communication. I think one of the important things we can do as a mayor affecting uh, change is, is that listen to the other governmental bodies. You know, being elected mayor, I'd certainly reach out to the school leadership and the library, uh, park district, the township, the fire uh, department. I think we need to be on the same page. The best we can do for our community is a long range plan together, uh, not operating as separate groups. Uh, we, we, you know, there's some shared services that we can have. There might be savings along the way. And a lot of our planning overlaps and it would be uh, best if we uh, were all on the same page going forward. So thank you. To you, Mr. McMaster, how does a mayor affect change that makes a difference? What role does the mayor have in making decisions in the community? Well, as far as the police station goes, I believe the mayor can make sure that if anybody bidding on it is from the city of Sandwich. When they built the fire barn, not one person, not one from Sandwich, Illinois, got to work on that new fire barn. And I'd like to see at least somebody from Sandwich get the ability to bid on it and not just people from out of state. But uh, I, that's, that's what I'd like to see. Excellent, thank you. And uh, on to you, Mayor Robinson. Uh, how does a mayor affect change that makes a difference and what role does the mayor have in making decisions in the community? Well, obviously it's gonna be the direction. Uh, steering the ship, gonna be the leader, uh, basically bringing everybody together so they can make a decision to move forward with whatever project it is that they're talking about. Uh, specifically in reference to the police department, um, you know, it's not something that was just discussed within the last couple of months and the decision was made. This goes back 10 plus years as far as the city purchasing property, purchasing buildings, uh, having the PD designed, having it redesigned, um, you know, possibly two or three different times. So. Ultimately, a decision was made um, uh, by the city council to move forward with the police department. Um, we, we bonded for $3.2 million. Uh, those bonds were sold in less than three days. Uh, the rate that we got for those bonds were 2.06% on average. And, you know, that's money that we now have to pay for this police department. And again, it's something that's been planned for a long time. Uh, prior administrations, prior councils, everybody having a hand in on it and us finally pulling the trigger and following through with it. Um, also going to what Mr. McMaster said, totally agree. I think it'd be great if we've got local contractors that are able to do some of the construction and some of the work at the PD, because I think a lot of a lot of good craftsmen here in the area and, and a lot of pride would go into it where you drive by it every day and saying that they worked on that or they completed that. 
the bidding goes out to everybody. So as far as how bids are awarded, it's going to be based upon, you know, price and quality of work and things like that. And hopefully we do get a lot of local contractors because that's going to be good for our economy also. Absolutely. Thank you. A couple more questions here about the police station and we'll take it up again with you, Mayor Robinson. Um, what specifically does the mayor need to do to finalize whatever remaining decisions are left with the police station and how would you lead the council in doing that swiftly? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean with what's finalized. Um, the money is there for the PD now. So the next step, if that's what you're kind of asking as far as what happens next, um, uh, currently, uh, Harbor Contractors, which is the general contractor uh, that was hired several years ago to um, kind of oversee, uh, look at these projects for us, uh, do comparisons, and then ultimately uh, do the bidding, which they did a couple of years ago. Uh, they are going to be responsible for putting the bids out again. They're going to be working with their city engineer, Tom Horick, as far as the wording. Um, my guess is that probably sometime mid-April that the project will go out to bid. It will probably be out for about two or three weeks and possibly as early as late May, uh, there should be some construction or renovation uh, started there uh, with the police department on East 6th Street. Excellent, thank you. Same question to you, Mr. Latham. Um, as, uh, if elected mayor, what would you do to um, swiftly move forward with the police station project? Well, I think one of the greatest things the mayor can do in this particular process is to keep track of the budget. Uh, through construction management, you quite often run into uh, items that you just don't simply know about. You know, I'm sure it's got to be brought up to code. There are some things, just like any home remodeling project, that are seen and unforeseen. Uh, that can create a project like this to go over. And I think one of the greatest things the mayor can do is keep track of the change orders um, by making sure that, um, you know, that items are in place, uh, that we're tracking the progress, that we work with the construction team, and that we essentially make sure that uh, everything's in order. Um, that's the best thing we do. We don't want any overages. We don't want any surprises at the end. We don't want to find out that our $3.2 million was spent and we need another million or so. Um, so I think that that's the challenges that we face. Excellent, thank you. And now to you, Mr. McMaster, uh, if elected mayor, what would you do to lead the council swiftly to finalize everything for the um, Sandwich PD? Uh, I pretty much agree with Robinson on that. He pretty well summed it up. It's not really much a guy can do, or a mayor, but that's what, that's what it's gonna take. Excellent, thank you. Um, one final question, and you can feel free to speak to this as briefly as you would like. Um, the question is, again, about the police station, and the concern is, is it moving too far away from downtown, the apartments, uh, and schools? And I uh, would like to hear you respond to that concern from the community members. And so we'll begin this time uh, with Mr. Latham. Uh, is the uh, PD moving too far away from downtown, the apartments, or the schools, and uh, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, the one time I mute, it gets me off guard. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think one of the, the concerns is, is not that we need to build a new police department. Um, I certainly think that uh, we do. As an alderman, I know that it, it's uh, had issues over the year, and sometimes it costs more money over time to put a Band-Aid on a project uh, than to simply build it the correct way. Uh, I do look at the fire department, uh, the fire station. Uh, it's more like a bunker to me. It's uh, built to withstand, uh, you know, uh, storms, uh, damage that we might have. We do sit on the sandwich fault. Those are all things that we need to consider. Um, you know, I do wonder about uh, the new police department being too far away. I'm in education and we always look at response times to schools. It puts it north of the tracks. Um, I do say why a building that has so much glass, um, why that location, why moving away from some of the crime that we have uh, are some of the locations in which the police department better serves uh, the area that they're in. And those are concerns. I think that if the project goes forward, those have to be addressed. Uh, maybe one of the issues is a small stub station um, that you have. If you look at the, par uh, the fire department's planning, they've already purchased property uh, north of town for future growth. And I think that's part of the planning process. 
And uh, I, I think that that's just a lot of concerns that need to be addressed. People ask a lot of questions, why that, that building? Why uh, that location? Um, why uh, not something else? Uh, I, I believe it's probably too far to back out of it, but I think we need to assure the community that that was the right choice and that we've done everything we can uh, uh, to make sure that uh, we respond to any issue that might come up in the future. Well, thank you. Mr. McMaster, same question to you. Is the PD moving too far away from downtown the apartments or the schools? And how would you respond to that concern within the community as mayor? Well, I don't think it's too far away from the schools or anything else. It's, I mean, we have four or five police officers patrolling all the, the whole area all the time. I mean, I'm pretty sure in any emergency, there would be somebody pretty close. They don't have to come from the police station. They're out on the road already. Uh, I don't think that's a problem. Excellent observation. Thank you. And uh, Mayor Robinson, same question to you. Uh, I'm going to agree with Jim on this, that the, the police department itself is not responding to a crime. It's going to be the police officers. And yes, they are out on the street with the exception if they're meeting a complainant or meeting a witness or something like that at the police department or with an arrestee. For the most part, they should be out patrolling. That's why they call it patrol officers, where they're driving around, they're out in public, where they're being seen. Um, you know, there are uh, two schools on the north side of town, so they are closer to those schools. No, they're not as close to the high school and kind of that whole school complex where you've got the middle school, uh, the, the, the junior high, Haskin, and the high school in Ibic. But again, we do have a school resource officer uh, that is daily um, at the school complex. And then you've got the police that are on patrol. Uh, currently, Sandwich has three police officers assigned to each shift. You also have a chief of police and you have a detective that are working daytime um, hours. So uh, during the week, Monday through Friday, uh, for the most part, daytime hours, you'd probably have five people that could respond uh, to an emergency. Uh, most of the other shifts, weekends and everything else, there's typically three people that are assigned uh, to a shift in the city of Sandwich. Hopefully I answered that. Yeah, absolutely. That's very helpful. Thank you so much for all of you responding to that concern. We're going to move on to our last category here, and this is on city improvements. Roads and other infra infrastructure repairs or replacements are obvious, concern obvious concerns for the citizens of Sandwich. Now, how do the candidates today plan on prior prioritizing these improvements and budgeting them long term. And uh, this time we'll begin with Mr. McMaster. And so the question is, how will you as mayor prioritize an infrastructure repair? Oh boy, well, <laughs> that's a good question. I'll try the first thing I'd do would be to teach the city employees how to properly flush fire hydrants. As you know, uh, for years, they've just been going around opening hydrants, flushing them here and there, wherever. Well, that's not how it works. You have to isolate certain areas by shutting off valves. Then you go along in a certain category and flush the hydrants. Then you move to another section. You don't just drive around opening hydrants. That's a totally big waste of money and a waste of water. And as you know, Oswego, Montgomery, a lot of these little towns are trying to figure out where they're going to get their water from. Some of them are going to try and go through Aurora and buy it. Of course, they filter it from the Fox River. Now, our aquifer is still in pretty good shape. And we start saving on water now, we probably won't have to worry about that like all these other communities. But that's just a few of the things. There's a lot of things they need, need to be taught. So uh, I, I don't know. That's, that's one of the first things I do. Thank, Thank you. you. Very good. Mayor Robinson, um, how would you prioritize uh, infrastructure improvements? Well, I, I think in the question itself, they're prioritized. That's a constant thing that you're doing with the infrastructure that needs to be fixed in the city of Sandwich. Um, you know, you could spend a million dollars on sidewalk and still not get all the sidewalk done in the city of Sandwich that would ultimately need to be repaired up to ADA code and things like that. I'm a big believer in, you know, if we can get something better than what it was, um, even if it wasn't up to code, I would think that would be better than the way it is, whether it's broken or non-existent or whatever the case might be. Um, 
when we prioritize, and this is a thing I think that a lot of citizens don't realize because they think, you know, we're not doing anything. They don't uh, see anything being done. But we do have uh, tests being done. We do have studies being done to know how things are going to work, what it's going to cost, and how we're going to uh, fix it down the road. And once we're doing these fixes, how it's going to affect the rest of the infrastructure further down the road. So, you know, it might not seem like we're doing anything, but we're getting things um, analyzed. We're getting things determined to where we can uh, do the work to figure this stuff out. We talk about the storm sewer and when that stuff, you know, is getting fixed or, or getting um, put in place, that obviously is going to help out with a lot of the flooding issues that we've had in town, especially in the areas where there is no storm water because there's nowhere for the water to go other than in people's yards um, and worst case scenarios in their basements. Absolutely. Thank you. And same question to you, Mr. Latham. Um, how would you prioritize infrastructure repair and, and plan for that in the budget? Right. So I think you look at it two ways. You either say we're going to start at this location and we're going to work outward or inward uh, and repairing uh, what we can along the way in a phased process over time. Or we're simply going to work at the worst places first and address the, those um, to shore them up. You know, the example was sidewalks. You know, um, a lot of them have uh, trees grown on, so they're, they're not ADA compliant, they're dangerous. So that would be one approach. So streets, I think you seal crack those first, and I think we need to get back on track with a really good, strong uh, street improvement program. Sidewalks, um, yes, we have a lot of people that walk. Uh, we have a lot of people that can also report back into the city uh, when there's damage or needs repair. Uh, sewer, sewer is one of those things that uh, is usually in respect to capacity. Um, you know, here I'm looking at, this is the current uh, sewer proposal, uh, $18.3 million on top of $3.5 million or $2 million for police station is uh, $21.5 million. It's a lot of debt at one time. Uh, so the city is going to be very limited on what it can do. Uh, storm sewers are important. People get tired of their homes flooding, uh, their property being destroyed or damaged. Uh, it sometimes it's, it's just nerve wracking for them. And uh, we need to address those issues. We've done uh, testing already. We know where there's issues, where there's infiltration, and it's simply putting that plan in pay, uh, place. One of the challenges is we just lost a large car dealership that provided a lot of tax money to the community. You can't replace that. I've said at city council meetings where we talk about, uh, as Dirksen said, a million here and a million there, pretty soon you're targeting a lot of money. Uh, it's the same thing with the city council. Um, you really have to uh, look at what happens when something like that leaves your community and just can't be replaced. Now your priorities change. And uh, I think the best way to do that would be to go back to planning and, and looking at uh, what uh, the real problems are and uh, prioritizing them and then maybe thinking about them differently. We've also always have to pursue grants, federal grants, state grants. Uh, there's Build Illinois right now, which is for shovel ready pro uh, projects. And I think we have to continue to pursue those, even if we have to look at someone that writes grants on a, on a priority basis for the city. Excellent. Thank you all for answering that question. On this next question, we will begin with Mayor Robinson. Your, the question is, do you have a plan to help those in town with mental health needs and to see them get the services they require in order to prevent them from having frequent, frequent run-ins with the police? Um, unfortunately, I don't believe that's necessarily a city issue. Um, it's more of a, a community issue. Um, you know, we, we've got a hospital in town and I can tell you that a lot of times the people waiting in the emergency room there might not be for actual injuries, but they're there for mental health evaluations. Um, it, there's very few places for people to go that have the mental health issues. And it's a problem not only in Sandwich, but all over the, all over the state of Illinois, all over the country. Um, you know, I, I retired from the Cal County Sheriff's Office. We dealt with mental health issues all the time. And we spent lots of time uh, taking people to hospitals where sometimes they're there for a day or two waiting for a bed. And a lot of times they're waiting in the emergency rooms until a bed at a facility becomes available to them. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's just not things set up in the system, uh, you know, through the, through the city, through the county, or even at the state level. It's, it's falling through the cracks, unfortunately. And I don't believe there's an answer at the city level for that. It's, it's got to be something bigger. Um, you know, 
uh, it needs to be more facilities. There needs to be more bed space. Um, you know, I know the police get training as far as how to deal with these individuals. Um, specifically, I'm guessing this question could have to do with a resident who um, has some issues and constantly has run-ins with the police. And again, if there's crimes being committed, they're being committed and that's why the person's being arrested. Unfortunately, with the way that the criminal justice system is right now, a lot of times it's just a signature and the person is out of jail again. And again, it's the system is broken as far as being able to help people with mental health issues. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a real task for everybody. I wish I had an answer for that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Mr. Latham, same question to you. Sure, so it is a complex issue and it's something that uh, our nation uh, has been faced with and challenges uh, to us. Uh, I don't know that it is, again, a sandwich issue. I, I do agree with those statements uh, made by Rich. Uh, I think one of the things that we can look at is the DeKalb County does have a mental health board. Um, that we can look into um, and I think they maybe have some resources even if we provide those or, or better yet maybe do an awareness campaign where our citizens know where to go get that help. Uh, we do have a hospital, we do have expertise in the area. Um, you know those are all things that, and I think they're also complicated and compounded by COVID. I, I know that the suicide rates are up. Uh, I know that that's a challenging issue and maybe some of that will reside you know as uh, the communities open up. Um, but I think we have to look for resources beyond our community to solve this issue. Excellent. And same question to you, Mr. M Mr. McMaster. Um, how would you help provide uh, resources for those with mental health needs to prevent them from frequent run-ins with the police? I wish I had an answer for that. I, I'd uh, I'd be something if I had an answer for that. But there's, yeah. it's just nothing I can answer. Thank you. Thank you for Sorry. that. Sorry. That's all right. Um, and um, our last question here before we go to um, uh, final comments, and we'll begin this time with, with Mr. Latham. Last June, many community members gathered downtown in Sandwich to protest peacefully, marching alongside and raising their voices with the Black community to cry out for justice. As mayor, how would you labor for the justice and well-being of people of color in our community? Well, I served in the military and serving in the military, you don't defend any individual rights. You just, you uh, defend and preserve the rights of all individuals. Uh, I do think that it's important as mayor to listen to your community, uh, to listen to all voices, uh, let them be heard. Um, there are some things that we probably can solve as a community and some that are greater than us. And, and I think the biggest thing is just to look for a, you know, a way to be fair and equitable across the community. Uh, as mayor, um, that might be putting in some programs that just might simply be awareness. Um, I do believe that people have an opportunity to express themselves. I, I do applaud the police department and, and the city. It was done a very peaceful process. It was organized. It let people uh, have an opportunity to express the way that they felt. And uh, I'm glad to see that within our community, there was no violence or any uh, other outfall from that. So I, I believe, uh, you know, a thank you goes out to everybody that was involved. I think it was a very uh, nice way to um, uh, come downtown and uh, be heard. And I respect all opinions. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. McMaster, same question to you. How would you labor for the justice and well-being of people of color in our community? Well, well, on one thing, we don't have a lot of people of color in our community, but anybody that is, is welcome in sandwich. I'm sure of that. I, mean, I don't know. I, I'm, I've never been a bigot. I don't know. I grew up with probably the only black kid in town, and I just, I never consider him black so I, I just don't understand the, the people that are upset with black people they're all friends to mine that's all I know thank you thank you and lastly to you Mayor Robinson uh, how would you labor for the justice and well-being of uh, people of color in our community well again I think everybody needs to be treated fairly and respectfully and I think if you treat people like that um, they're going to treat you the same uh, you know, you, you refer to the several hundred people that were there for the peaceful protest uh, last summer. Um, it was planned. Uh, the chief and I both met with uh, the organizer of it ahead of time. And just so we knew what was going on, just so we can be prepared. Because if you think back at that time frame, there were other communities that were having tons of damage, not too far from here. You had uh, protests up in DeKalb where they were breaking into the, the 
the stores, you know, they were, um, they were burning things. They broke into the liquor stores and everything else. So there was a lot of damage even up there, um, you know, and then further east, it only got worse with a larger population. So we are very fortunate that the people that peacefully protested here and, and, and sandwiched for social equality and, and, and for everyone being treated correctly the way they should, you know, love one another type thing. And, and it was a great turnout. The other thing about the city of Sandwich, if anybody was around during that peaceful protest, there were just as many citizens of Sandwich that were downtown watching the event as were participating in it. And that's the neat thing that I thought about the city of Sandwich was residents, young and old families and everything might not have been participating, but they were all there just witnessing it and taking it all in. Excellent. Thank you all for responding to that question as well. And now I'll uh, open up to you each to have about one minute to share any final uh, closing remarks that you would have for uh, all of the folks who have shared questions. And uh, this time we will begin with Mr. McMaster. Uh, any final thoughts in closing? No, nothing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Mayor Robinson, any final uh, comments? Uh, real quick, I want to make sure that people were aware that when Jovic left the city of Sandwich, just so they know, they were offered incentives uh, by the city of Sandwich. They were offered up to $800,000 in its incentives. What the city was trying to do was basically anything over $250,000 that we would receive from them in sales tax, anything above that, for I want to say the agreement was going to be about 12 or 13 years, they would be able to keep all of the sales tax above that. And the reason we did that number was that's what we were getting at the time. And we thought that that would be the, the best way of doing it. I mean, you can't be, be the deal like Plano gave them, which is $8 million. But if we were to do something like that, that would be a long time before we would get it. I mean, could be 20 years, could be whatever. So I wanted to point that out. I also want to thank you, Matt, for um, putting you in the library for putting on this forum. Um, I thought it was a good idea. Um, you know, important thing for us is just to continue our future planning here for the city of Sandwich. Uh, but equally as important as the future planning is the follow through. Um, and I think that's what the city council needs to stay on task with, uh, with the assistance of the mayor. Um, my website is www.robinson, the number four, mayor.org. And you can look there for contact information. I want to thank all my supporters. And to the citizens of Sandwich, it doesn't matter who you vote for, just vote. That would be my suggestion. I also wanted to thank both Jim and Todd because this election cycle has been the most tame. It has been cordial. There has not been any negative things whatsoever uh, by the candidates. Um, I, I, I just... I can't thank them enough because I, you know, I, I think we're in a good position and I just wanted to say thank you. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Latham, any closing remarks? Yes, I agree. I want to thank the library. I want to thank you, Matthew. Uh, I want to thank Jim and Rich as well. I know when you decide to run for a political office, uh, there's always some challenges uh, getting your word out uh, where you stand on positions. Not everyone's going to agree with you. Uh, sometimes the door gets slammed in your face. Sometimes the conversation ends quickly. And that's just life. Um, I do agree that we all have the best interests of our community in mind. Uh, I think uh, looking forward as mayor, I think the first week could be simply just assessing all of our structures, our uh, buildings, uh, our equipment, uh, and then formulate a plan of what uh, the replacement time would be for those and the cost. Then I think it's important that you meet with your city employees to find out how better to run this city. Uh, who knows then then? When we talk about the mayor and the council's job as uh, steering the boat, it's, it's really the employees that row it and and then it, for us to be responsive to the community i think it's then it's meeting with community partners and coming up with the plan one of the things i was successful at was a board retreat for the park district where we simply realized that when we go to meetings we make choices and we make decisions and we don't have a lot of time for dialogue or thought or planning and a board retreat is something that i would implement would be great for that because that allows you to have those conversations it's an open meeting to the public it's transparent and you have some deeper conversations about what we value and what we prioritize and then you can simply put that plan in, in place that your capital plan the first year rolls right into your budget and replace it with a new capital plan as issues, concerns, and priorities come available. 
uh, you know, being mayor is a lot of responsibility and, and I'm willing to do that. I'm ready for it. I want to thank people for coming out to vote. This isn't probably a very exciting time to come out to vote. There's not a lot of controversy. There's not a lot of great things on uh, the ballot, but I want to thank everyone for coming out and exercising that right. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, you did ask me how people could contact me. It's Latham for mayor. It's L-A-T-H-A-M, the number four, mayor at gmail.com. Questions, concerns, I'd love to talk to you. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for uh, joining us and being willing to answer the questions that our community has submitted. And thank you all for uh, who have joined us online and over the phone to listen in. Just to let you know, this session has been recorded and will be posted on our YouTube page as well as our website. And so you can visit sandwichpld.org to find this and all of our other online program we've had in the recent uh, past. But thank you again so much to the candidates for coming out and um, head to the ballot boxes as soon as possible. Thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Be safe. Take thank care. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.